is Cliff here, how are you doing? I'm uh, running a couple of my Tormax in the other part of the shop, you can probably hear them there. Um, I set up the fourth axis this morning and I'm currently running the Impact Tolerant Touch Pro bodies and then I set up Rapid Turn and I'm doing a production turning job for uh, uh, one of my repeat customers. And um, when I got both those machines running, I've then been able to do a bit of uh, manual machining here in this quieter part of the shop. So I've had three machines running quite a bit this afternoon and um, it's been really satisfying. So I put together uh, a video, uh, probably a couple of videos um, on uh, a few subjects to do with setting up fourth axis and uh, running two CNC's at once in a little shop. Alright, cheers. So I'm just setting up my 1100 to do a fourth axis production job and I thought I'd take a few clips along the way. So I'm just mounting the uh, Super Spacer 6 inch on the table. Um, just to reiterate, I've got other uh, fourth axis videos. If you look on my, if you look on my playlists, uh, you'll see fourth axis playlist. Um, I've got a 8mm stud here with a thread on it and a nut the same size as this 10 millimeter bolt going through to the T-nut so I can adjust it quickly um, and tighten it up quickly. That's a, a small thread just drilled with a, uh, a pistol drill in this position on that end. Um, so first thing is I set the table the uh, fourth axis up uh, at right angles by clocking on a traverse across the faceplate and then I'm mounting a little chuck uh, this is the chuck off rapid turn it's a uh, hundred millimeter or approximately four inch chuck and um, you can see what I've done here is just drilled right through if you look at the back of the chuck of all of these chucks they inevitably have a little threaded hole if they don't have a through hole in three positions here here and here this is a very light duty 100 millimeter chuck but the rapid turn chuck is a heavier duty and it has heavier sections and castings and um, it sacrifices in order to get heavier casting and heavier jaws it sacrifices on the size of the scroll but this makes it a very rugged little chuck and there's plenty of room there to drill those M8 threads right through because there's only blank cast iron in there drill it right through with uh, say a, a clearance on a 6mm cap screw um, and put in a counterbore it and then you can put 6mm caps through to T-nuts and then you can mount the small chuck straight on the faceplate of the fourth axis and there's a big advantage in doing this because a small chuck gives a lot more clearance around here for your uh, spindle and cutter uh, is less likely to snag on small profile jaws and a small profile chuck I've mentioned this in other videos and I've been doing it for years where you have a through hole here and cap screws on the front of the chuck and this means that you can have your register ring with a small amount of clearance on it and you can dial in your chuck exactly true with those screws just lightly nipped up until it's running perfectly true on a dowel or on the part if you wish and then you can lock them up and you get a really good concentricity. You can see over here some other chucks that I've done that too and most chucks have got blank cast iron in this portion beyond the threaded section in the back that will allow you to just drill through and counter bore very quickly and some a very quick and simple little modification that gives your chucks more versatility so with a small chuck you have really good clearance the jaws are small and the diameters are small and another advantage of direct mounting a chuck straight on to the fourth axis uh, is that the closer you can get it to the fourth axis bearings or headstock bearings the less projection out it has 
the more rigid and accurate it will be. Obviously the further you hang out, uh, the more play and less rigidity issues you'll have. The closer you can get back into those bearings, the better. So when you're setting a chuck concentric, whether it's on the lathe with clearance on the register ring, or whether it's on the faceplate of a fourth axis, the process is very similar. I'll just swing the stepper motor out of engagement here. Let me just focus in a bit more. And now you're free to just turn the chuck um, with a dial indicator on a critical diameter that you want to, to be concentric. Have a look at the total run out. So it's about 0.25. Find it its highest position so the weight is up above center. It'll tend to drop, drop down about half that amount. And it'll inevitably swing off to one side. And so it's a sort of an iterative process. Now I've got it within about 0.07. And now it's running pretty true, good enough for camera, and just nip up these cap screws, and you've got it concentric and really rigidly mounted as quick as that. While we're talking about mounting chucks that are free to float, um, sometimes, in the case of rapid turn, there's actual clearance behind the uh, mounting uh, adapter plate, and you can have nuts here behind this flanged adapter plate um, and then again the process is the same you just slightly nip them up and clock on the stymeter but one thing to remember especially with a light headstock that's running in bearings like rapid turn not so bad on a big rugged lathe or on a fourth axis but if you've got a light headstock like this you really don't want to be hammering down on there severely you know I, I, you can do it but just nip these screws very lightly and just tap them very lightly because remember that that impact will brunel the bearings into the spindle and it won't take too much of a smack on here to damage the spindle bearings. And so you only have to have these screws literally finger tight and the tap only needs to be, you know, half a pound, quarter of a pound, just a very light tap, just enough to shift it because you've got the weight of gravity working on your side if you tap it down uh, when it's in its utmost position. It only just needs a little bit of movement to overcome the friction. So just keep that in mind. Don't damage your spindle bearings for goodness sake because once that's done it's a downhill slide and um, it's done so easily. And when you're clocking the fourth axis in alignment you can just nip up, say, the back stud and have the front stud here loose and then you can uh, traverse and then just tap it until it's true. Uh, I know this is really obvious stuff and most of us are already doing this but you know it's amazing how often I pick up little tr tricks like this that just refine the process even after decades of doing it. So, you know, I sort of keep adding little basic things like that. So you, so you get that clocked up, pivoting on the back stud, and then nip that up. So it literally only takes 10 seconds to set it. And then the next stage is to engage the stepper motor back fully engaged. Nip up that lock there. And now we can run it and put some lube in it. Let's just pop it on one turn, say. It's a good idea to put a few shots of oil in it when it's running. So that you're actually getting lubricant penetrating deeply inside it. because there isn't big reservoirs of oil in the super spacer and it's good to give it a good shot of oil before you start a production run. Okay, so the next stage is to set up the offsets or uh, the spindle center line to the fourth axis center line. Um, so I'm going to use my probe to do that and um, I'll just use a probing routine to find the Y 
center line position so they're both aligned. But if we look on the uh, Pathpilot probe page, you can see there's all sorts of uh, probing routines that help you to set up quickly bosses and holes and blocks and so on. But there's not one that's ideal for doing an external part like that. So I'll just show you one way of doing it now that's relatively straightforward. One way of doing it is to go to the XYZ probe page and this little red circle represents the uh, probe stylus and that represents the work. So I can probe in on the front face of the part and that will, if I click on that button, I will probe Y and set the work origin. That's the Y axis DRO on zero and then I can jog around to the back and instead of setting the same button again I can just go find Y. Let me show you that now. Okay the first thing I'll do is probe the front face probe the front face of the probe body. So I'll come down to approximately the Z center height. Probably about there somewhere. So about there. It's not critical because I'm not going to move in the Z. Then I'll go to the probe page and I'll find that front edge. Probe Y set work origin. So that's set the YDRO on zero on the front edge. Then I'll just traverse around to the back edge. Can be quite relaxed here because if I crash, I'm only going to go retract the probe. I'm not going to damage it. So now I'm going to probe the back edge, but this time I'm going to use find the Y. So it's basically doing a measurement from the front to the back. And that's found what the Y is, or if you like, the diameter of the part at that random Z height. Okay, so just showing you on Pathpilot, so we're on the XYZ probe page. And the first thing we did was probed the front surface here, probe Y set work origin, and that set the Y DRO position to zero on the front face. Then we went round to the back and we probed the back face with this button, Find Y. And that basically measured the width of the probe body at that level of Z, which is 44.15. And then we just traversed, well then I just traversed in the Y axis on the DRO until I got half that diameter, 22.07. It might be a little bit clunky, but it's very quick and safe, and it gets it within, you know, uh, less than a hundredth of a millimeter or half a thou. And once you've got the diameter or the Y set, then it's a pretty simple matter to set the top. Here we are, probe Z, set work origin, and set the end, probe X, set work origin. So let's just do that. Probe Z, set work origin. I'm shouting because of the rain on the roof again. Quick as that.
you're drilling, of course, you want to avoid getting the swath or chips wrapping around the drill and causing a rat's nest. There's several good reasons to avoid that. One is that the rat's nest stops the coolant from reaching the cutting edge because it's spinning around as a barrier. Also, it tempts you to get involved and try and manually remove it. That's not safe. And also, you should be away doing something else when the CNC is running, not fiddling around with it. So there are ways you can set the drilling operation so that it doesn't produce a rat's nest. That is, if you have a short pick and a full retract and a uh, fairly heavy feed rate for the RPM, then you'll get short, stiff chips coming out cleanly. See if I can show that in operation. So at that fairly fast feed rate for the RPM, we're getting a, a chip thickness or a, sw a ribbon of swarth of about 0.12, that's about 5 thou. Um, obviously there's two of those per revolution, so you can do the calculations, um, the RPM of the spindle and the uh, feed rate and the chip load are the uh, three factors in that equation, aren't they? So you can see that that's a... Uh, a fairly simple bit of maths to do and you can work out uh, how to get that stiff chip that is less likely to wrap around this, the uh, drill bit. But in practice it's often better to suck it and see. You know, working out the theory of feeds and speeds and chip load and so on, there's, there's so many factors that you're unaware of. Often it's better just to try it and then go to your uh, code, find where the feed rate is here, F180 and tweak it up or down or the RPM up or down um, is often a better way to go than having too much theory. That's enough for one video, isn't it? Thanks for following me, guys. Cheers.